my name's Sheila. I'm the Education Outreach and Diversity Officer at the Royal Astronomical Society. Welcome to today's secondary level space session. Hopefully you are all safe and well at home. I'm going to share my screen with you, the first thing to do. And at the end of my talk about the galaxies and the universe, there will be time for question and answers. And there have been some question and answers coming through. So um, we will make sure we answer those as well. If you do want to do, ask a question or any comments or anything, please use the chat function because you're all muted. Um, and I've, I've done some shout outs already, but we've got a couple more. We've got Arthur in Peckham and Florence in York. So do keep chatting to me using the chat function. But while I'm presenting, I might not keep an eye on it as well as I could do. So um, just be patient with me because I'm doing two things at once. So those of you that haven't joined one of these sessions before, and if you have missed any, they are available on YouTube. Um, you, won't have heard, you won't have met me before. Um, and I'd like to introduce myself. So like I said, my name's Sheila. I work for the Royal Astronomical Society, but um, in my lifetime, I've had a really, really exciting life because I've been interested and involved in the space industry. So I became interested in space when I was 13 and I watched a film called Apollo 13 and I realised that I would like to be an astronaut. So back then the internet didn't exist and I went to the library and I read about astronauts and I read about a couple of astronauts who had PhDs in chemistry and astrophysics. So I didn't really know what a PhD meant back then, but I decided that that was the route that I was going to take. Um, and I have a degree from Manchester University in physics with astrophysics. And my PhD is from the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, which is part of UCL in London. And during my PhD, I used the Cassini spacecraft to study the planet Saturn and got my PhD in 2012. Then I kind of realised I also enjoy talking about science as much as I like doing it. So I trained to be a teacher and I've been working at the Royal Astronomical Society since 2014. And with my job, I have met some incredible people. I've got to travel all over the planet. I've been to Australia and America and Europe. I've, um, I was supposed to go to Africa actually at the moment, but obviously that's not, um, not happening at the moment. But I've had a really, really cool life being a space scientist and astronomer. And like I said, I work for the Royal Astronomical Society, which um, is a learned society. It's a membership organization for astronomers, geophysicists, planetary scientists, anyone in the space industry. And it was formed in 1820. So it's 200 years old this year. The offices are based in central London and there are some really cool rooms in the offices. They're on Piccadilly in Burlington House. There's a, a meeting room that we use quite extensively. And there's the second largest astronomical library in the UK. And it's a proper old fashioned library that smells of books and has really, really cool objects in including books written by Galileo and Newton. Now our first president was the astronomer, William Herschel, who's at the bottom left of the screen. Um, and our one of the more recent presidents is um, next to him there, the picture of Professor John Zarnecki, a planetary scientist just like me. The reason I show these two pictures kind of shows you that um, the face of astronomy hasn't appeared to have changed much in the last 200 years. But hopefully with you guys and the next generation, we can show that astronomy is for everyone. It's a completely inclusive science. And if you are interested in astronomy, there is a job out there for you. And one of my favourite things um, is talking about women in astronomy and other space scientists and other planetary scientists who are um, more diverse than the ones that we kind of think of when we first hear the word astronomer. Now, just a couple of quick questions. Um, so this record, the reason that we record these sessions is so that we can put them on our YouTube channel so that you can watch them again. Or if anything goes wrong, um, there is a copy of them for um, future use. And um, da, 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 any other questions? Um, Uranus does spin on its side. Um, and that's, we believe that's because it was knocked by maybe an asteroid or um, a meteoroid 
when it was very, very young and it actually was tipped by almost 90 degrees. So the Royal Astronomical Society is based in central London, but it's an international organisation. And um, when things open up again, we do have open houses um, and open days that you can actually visit the premises um, and meet some of the prolific scientists that are part of our society. Now, if you're interested in getting a job in the space industry, you might think about jobs like astronaut and astrobiologist, who is someone who looks for or thinks about what aliens might look like um, in, the, in the solar system and beyond. Um, but there are more unusual jobs in the space industry that you might not have heard of. So you could be a planetary scientist like me, you could be a space weather risk manager, you could work with data in the Antarctic or the bottom of the ocean. And if you're really interested in the space industry but less interested in science, there are also other routes that you can pursue. For example, you could be a science presenter, a space artist, you could be a space lawyer. Um, if, you're in, if you're interested in animals, you could be a space vet, you could be a doctor who is also an astronaut. There are basically a million jobs that you could do if you're interested in space and want to work in the space industry. And astronauts and space scientists tend to be quite multi, um, multi-talented and have lots of different hobbies and um, interests. So you might not just be a scientist, you might also be a space artist as well. It's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty cool place to work. Okay, so my first question to you, and you can talk to the people that you're with in the room, or you can write on the chat function to me. What are we looking at? I've got a picture here on the screen, and my first question to you is, what are we looking at? Okay, so we're getting some answers back at the moment. Excellent. So there are um, galaxies is the question mark, the universe, are we looking at the galaxy, the universe, the observable universe, a picture from the Hubble te Space Telescope, galaxies, galaxies, excellent. So what we're looking at in this picture, and at first glance you might think that this, the points of light are stars, but they're not actually, they are galaxies. It's a Hubble deep field image of um, galaxies in our universe. And it's just an incredible photo. It's so brilliantly detailed. And so if you think about it, we, you know, we live in one galaxy. And here in this picture, which is just a small chunk of the sky, there are hundreds of thousands of galaxies in this picture, just like the Milky Way. And, it's kind of mind blowing when you really stop and think about how big the universe is. Now, there's lots of different types of galaxies. Um, some, are, um, some are spiral shaped like ours that have curved arms, look like a pinwheel or a Catherine wheel if you, um, if you see those fireworks. But there are other types of galaxies. So there's elliptical galaxies which are more smooth and oval shaped and don't have the arms. There are ones that don't fit into either of those categories, like irregular shapes and blobs, or they might have been um, torn apart, or they might have merged with another galaxy to create an irregular shape. And the light that comes from the galaxies um, is actually coming from the stars in the galaxies. So um, what we're looking at when we look at galaxies is the light coming from the stars and also dust and um, other other gases and, and objects like that that block out the light and give them give the galaxies these incredible shapes. Now people have been looking at galaxies for a very long time um, and Edwin Hubble, an astronomer, um, came up with a classification scheme. This is called the, the Hubble tuning fork diagram because it looks like a tuning fork. If anyone has ever used a tuning fork to tune a musical instrument, it looks like a two-pronged fork and you bash it and um, it's a metal, a metal object and you bash it and it gives off a note and you can, tune your, um, you can tune your musical instruments from a tuning fork. So this is a, the Hubble tuning fork diagram and it's not a timeline, so it doesn't go in time from left to right, but what you can see is a, a way of classif 
classifying the different types of galaxy. So on the left, you've got the elliptical galaxies, where E is the elliptical and the, the numbers um, give a different um, how squashed the galaxy is. So E naught is sort of almost spherical. And then you're getting up to E7, which is much more squashed, much more elongated and more like a fried egg almost, a sort of fried egg shaped galaxy. And then on the top prom, you've got your spiral galaxies. And, and again, the, um, the S is for spiral, but this time there's letters A to C, and they're denoting a different amount of winding of spiral arm with the, the main bit of the galaxy in the middle and then the spiral arms coming off. So you can see SA has very few spiral arms and SC has lots and lots. And then the bottom prong is the spiral barred galaxy. So SB, A, S, B, B. And if you look at the, the, the images, you can see across the middle of the galaxy, there's a bar that kind of connects the spiral arms together. And that's why they're called spar barred spiral. So these are some examples of, of the ones that um, Hubble classified. Um, and when we look at galaxies, we can roughly classify them into these three um, groups. But over time, and with better and better technology than what Hubble had, we have been able to improve the Hubble tuning fork diagram um, and add different categories into that um, into that diagram and lots of diff more different types of galaxy within those categories. So we still have the ellipticals, the spirals and the barred spirals, but we have a lot more irregular galaxies now as well. And we, we can look at the bulges um, in the middle. We can look at intermediate, intermediate spirals, unbarred spirals. So there's lots and lots and lots um, going on in the universe. And a couple of questions. Um, so isn't Hubble also a shuttle or a probe? Well, Hubble um, also, um, he didn't build a, a teles this telescope, but this telescope was named after him. So the Hubble Space Telescope is named after Edwin Hubble. Um, what is my favourite type of galaxy? Well, probably a barred spiral because that's what the Milky Way is like and it's quite beautiful. Um, and how can we tell the shape of the galaxy if we only see the side profile? Well, I will kind of cover that a little bit during this, um, this session, but um, basically we look at all the galaxies that we can see um, from the top down and we can see the spirals and we um, can also see some galaxies edge on and we can see the bulges and the halos and stuff. Um, and we can make inferences between the two based on the two different types. And we can also measure how fast the spiral arms are spinning um, by looking at the hydrogen in the galaxies and we can measure the dust. And by looking at those, all those different things, we can actually build up a really good picture of what the galaxies look like. Okay, so this is the Hubble tuning fork diagram, but updated for the 21st century. And if you're interested in classifying galaxies, there is a citizen science project called Zooniverse, um, Galaxy Zoo. And you can, even from home, um, even like now, you can go to zooniverse.org and have a look at the Galaxy Zoo classification um, project. And you can use real data to classify different galaxies into those different groups. So if you are interested, do have a look at that. So the link is, um, you should be able to see the, the link on my screen now, zooniverse.org. Um, or just Google Galaxy Zoo and it will come up. Okay, next question. What are we looking at here? What are we looking at here? Okay, it's not Northern Lights. It's not a nebula. It is, it's not the Magellanic Clouds, which actually most of us, I think today are in the Northern Hemisphere. We can't see the Magellanic Clouds from here. But those of you in Australia, you can see them. It's not a meteor, it's not a star storm. They're not artist impressions. It's not the Oort Cloud. They are, it is four different pictures of the Milky Way, but more specifically, one of the spiral arms, um, or the spiral arms of the Milky Way um, from, 
viewed from the earth um, and the darker bits you can see are dust and the light is coming from the stars in the Milky Way and if you imagine seeing something like this with the naked eye before you knew what it was it does look kind of milky and that's actually where the name comes from so the Milky Way galaxy is our galaxy it's the galaxy that we are part of and you're actually seeing the stars from the Milky Way with the dust um, causing those kind of patterns, the darker patches um, across the sky. Now, the Earth is part of the solar system. So the, our star is the sun. And then we have the eight planets and the dwarf planets and all the other things in the solar system. And our solar system lives on one of the arms of the Milky Way galaxy. And from lots of analysis, lots of looking at the Milky Way in different wavelengths and measuring the dust and measuring the hydrogen, we are able to have a look um, or infer what the Milky Way really, really looks like and where we are in it. So the Milky Way, the plane of the Milky Way is actually inclined to about 60 degrees to our sun. Um, and in the UK, which I think most of us are in the UK, it's easiest to find if you look for the constellation Cassiopeia, which on, on this picture is on the left, it looks a bit like a W, and you follow Cassiopeia towards Cygnus, which is this sort of cross, it's actually a Cygnus is the swan, um, but it looks a bit like a cross. And um, if you draw a line between Cassiopeia and Cygnus, the Milky Way lies across that plane. So in the summer, when it gets dark, you are able to, it is quite easy to spot Cassiopeia, this giant W in the sky. Um, and if you, if you then find um, Cygnus, you can draw a line and the Milky Way should be across there. You can see it anywhere in the, on the, on, in the world. Obviously the darker, um, less light polluted skies are better. The best place I've seen the Milky Way has been um, Thailand and Australia, I think both mostly because the skies are clear, clearer. Um, if you go to, you know, when you're allowed to, if you go to somewhere dark in the UK on a clear night, you will be able to see the Milky Way, but it's just better to view it um, in countries where the weather tends to be better. Okay, so the Milky Way is a barred spiral. And um, what we're actually doing, because we live in the Milky Way, when we see that arm, we're looking along the plane of it. So we never see the Milky Way from the top down. We never see that it's a spiral um, because we live inside the Milky Way. So whenever you show pictures of the Milky Way, it's not pictures of the actual Milky Way like this. It's at, uh, like you can see at the bottom, it's an artist's representation of what the Milky Way looks like. We can't ever take a picture top down of the Milky Way because we live in it and we can't send anything outside of the Milky Way because we don't have the technology to do so. So we, um, we live within the Milky Way. Um, the Milky Way is about 120,000 light years across. So it takes about 120,000 years for the light to cross across the path of um, our galaxy. And from the center, from the central bulge, we live about 30,000 light years away. So we're not at the very edge, we're sort of halfway, halfway between. And we live on one of the arms um, of, the, of the Milky Way. And we know this from looking at data coming from, from the stars and from the, the hydrogen and the dust in our galaxy. Now it contains more than, 20, uh, more than 200 billion stars. And there is a bar across the center of the Milky Way. And so our Milky Way is, um, is classified as an SB, sparred viral galaxy, and C because of the spiral arms, because of the winding of the spiral arms. And the arms come from, it's, it's all to do with rotation, the rotation of the, of the, um, of the stars and, um, and gravity. So, um, over time, this, the, the arms will change shape a little bit. They tend to be younger stars um, closer in and older stars in the, in the arms. Um, and stars do sort of move along the, the spiral arms depending on how old they are. But the reason that the galaxies have, have these arms is, is all to do with the rotation and gravity. Gravity is very important in, um, in space. Now, if you look at the Milky Way edge on, um, 
kind of like what we're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, when we see it in the sky, we are seeing this more of this sort of view because we live inside the Milky Way. Um, and the, there are stars and, um, that don't lie exactly in the Milky Way, and that's called the halo of stars. And there's also globular clusters with, ol uh, with old stars in as well. Um, now the center is called the central bulge um, and the nucleus, and then we've got the halo of stars, the disk of material, which is along the plane. And then, like I said, these globular clusters, which are clumps of stars, um, which are part of the Milky Way, but they aren't in the main um, bit of the Milky Way. So there's lots of different, um, there's lots of different words to classify different bits of the Milky Way. And in the center, we do have a supermassive black hole um, in Sagittarius. So there are black holes in the middle of every galaxy, just like the sun is in the center of our solar system and the sun's gravity helps the solar system stay in place. The, the, uh, the black holes in the center of um, each galaxy help the, the stars in the galaxy stay in place. Um, and like I said, uh, the, the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. So it's, um, it's pretty big. It's pretty big. Now, moving out from the Milky Way, we live in um, our galaxy is part of something we call the local group. Now, those of you in Australia, you will be able to see the large and small Magellanic clouds, which are irregular dwarf galaxies, um, which live sort of south of the Milky Way if we're zooming out um, of, of from our galaxy zooming out. And other notable galaxies in our um, in our local group of galaxies are the Triangulum Galaxy, M33, and then Andromeda Galaxy, M31. And Andromeda Galaxy is the only galaxy that we can see um, in the Northern Hemisphere with the naked eye in the Andromeda constellation. In the Southern Hemisphere, you can also see the large and small Magellanic clouds, but the Andromeda Galaxy is um, a small fuzzy blob in the constellation of Andromeda. And the, um, because of the gravity in space, um, everything is quite organized. So galaxies form in clusters of galaxies. So you wouldn't just find one galaxy by itself, but it lives in a neighborhood of, of galaxies that are gravitationally bound together. And they do actually orbit around each other. Um, and they're not really affected by the, the greater universe because they're, they're gravitationally bound together. So our galaxy is part of a, a cluster of galaxies which actually has about 50 galaxies in it. Um, and like I said, it's called the, the local group, um, but the, the notable ones are small and large Magellanic cloud, Andromeda galaxy and Triangulum. Um, and it's about, the, the local group is about three megaparsecs across, in, in, which in normal terms is about nine times 10 to the 19 kilometers across, or nine with 19 zeros after it, kilometers. So really, really huge. Um, and the Milky Way is just one part of the local group. And then moving out again, um, the galaxy clusters like the local group also make up super clusters. So um, clusters of galaxies are also grouped into clusters called superclusters. So this map here <coughs> is a map of our local supercluster. And each blob here isn't a galaxy, but it's a group of galaxies and maybe even thousands of galaxies within each blob. And we are part of the Virgo cluster. Um, and there's a local group there, the Virgo supercluster, sorry. So zooming out again, so we start on the top left with the Earth, the Earth is part of the solar system. The solar system is within the Milky Way. The Milky Way is within the local group. The local group is within the Virgo supercluster, which is in a, clo in a cluster of superclusters. And then we have the observable universe. Um, um, and then we have the observable universe. And we've measured the light coming from the observable universe with um, space telescopes um, to quite a good um, to quite a good degree. So <coughs> we are able to start making um, 
computer generated maps of the universe from measuring the light coming from different stars within the universe. So the Virgo supercluster here is in the middle of this, of this image. And then if we keep zooming out, that's an, a, a, the observable universe as viewed from our point of view. Now, we, we're in, for, for us, we're in the center of the universe. So when we map the universe, everything seems to be quite, um, quite well spread, evenly spread um, from our point of view. But if we lived in a different galaxy, in a different super galaxy, and we're mapping the universe, it would seem like they are at the center of the universe because it's their point of view. So whenever you see a map of the universe, um, we appear to be at the center, but that's, that's, it's not the same as the sun being at the center of the solar system. Um, and there's a question about um, the Andromeda galaxy. Is it going to crash into the Milky Way? I will mention that in a, in a minute. So um, it's a bit head spinny when you start to think about the visible universe and our, our place in it, um, because it kind of makes me think, it, make, it, makes, it gives me more questions when I think about the universe. So the light, um, the visible universe in terms of age is about 14 billion light years old, um, 14 billion light years across, sorry, 14 billion years old. Um, and we've measured this using um, something called the Hubble law. So Hubble's quite important. And so, um, that means the light takes 14 billion years to reach us. But, <coughs> um, and for this reason, everybody in the universe finds themselves at the middle of their own universe. But the universe is expanding, and I'll talk about this more in a minute. And so the galaxies at the edge of the universe might actually be even further away now because it takes 14 billion years or has taken 14 billion years for their light to um, travel to us. So it, it's a bit, like I said, it's a bit head spinning when you really think about it, but um, we can map it to, to quite a good level of accuracy, which is impressive. Now the light that is traveling from these, from these galaxies and from these stars um, is the same type of light that we have on the earth. Um, it's all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And light is a wave and different colors of light emit different wavelengths. So red, um, the red light emits um, a wave with quite a long wavelength, and then blue light emits a light with qu a quite short wavelength. So that's the peak to the peak. Um, so you can see that the blue light is more squashed up and that's because it's got more energy in it. Um, it's more energetic, so the wavelength is shorter. Um, so red light is more squashed up, violet light is, uh, red light is more spread out, violet light is more squashed up. Um, and if you start with violet light and stretch it, so imagine a piece of string or a slinky spring and you stretch it and you go up from violet, eventually you get to red light. And then if you keep stretching it, it turns into a different type of light in the electromagnetic spectrum. And in the opposite way, if you start with the red or the orange and you squash it, you will end up with the violet light. So the, the colours are able to change depending on... Um, depending on what's going on. So if you get the violet light and um, it is um, stretched and ends up more towards the red end of the spectrum, we call that red shift because the, re the light is turning red. And galaxies give off different light depending on what elements they're made from. So for example, if a galaxy has sodium in it, it will give off a yellowy orange light. And we know that from measuring sodium on the earth. However, when we look at galaxies with, for example, sodium in them, excuse me, instead of looking yellowy orange, they actually look red. So something strange is going on and we call this red shift. So red shift is when an object in space appears to be redder than it should be. And what this means is the light is being stretched. So remember that, um, that wave. Now, if the light is being stretched, that's because the galaxy is moving away from you and it's red shifted. So if we see any galaxies that are red shifted, it's because they're moving away from us. In the opposite way, blue shift is when an object is coming towards you. So the light is being squashed. It becomes higher frequency, lower wavelength, and the light appears to be bluer. 
So we've got the red shift, which means an, a galaxy is moving away from us, and the blue shift, which means that the galaxy is moving towards us. Um, and here's a little image there for you. So if, if you look at a galaxy, you know what it's supposed to look like and it looks bluer, that's because it's moving towards you. And if it looks redder, that's because it is moving away from you. And we call this red shift. So we are able to do this with galaxies in, um, in our universe. And we have measured the Andromeda galaxy and it is blue shifted, which means it is going to collide with the Milky Way. So the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way are going to collide with each other, but not for about 4 billion years. Um, so we don't need to worry about that immediately. And when they do collide, we don't exactly know what happens. We imagine that both galaxies will kind of be ripped apart because of the huge um, gravitational forces. And maybe they will um, rip each other apart and then come together in a um, elliptical galaxy or an irregular galaxy, but a supermassive um, galaxy full of two galaxies worth of stars. So it would be quite an impressive thing to watch but um, obviously quite um, disastrous for the solar system and other things in the Milky Way. Now because we are able to look at galaxies and measure whether they're being blue shifted or red shifted we have done this with lots and lots of galaxies in space and what we see is that most of the galaxies from our point of view are moving away from us which means from our point of view, the universe is expanding. Now, if we know that the universe is, is expanding at the moment, we can rewind the clock. We can think about what it would have looked like previously. And if it's expanding now and we rewind the clock, we can work out that at some point, the entire universe must have been squashed into a single point into a single point and we call this the big bang so the big bang was an explosion at the beginning of the universe um, that um, was a single point that exploded at the beginning of the universe and over time things have evolved to include galaxies but because of this initial explosion everything is still moving away from each other and the universe is still expanding so we had the Big Bang and then there was a period of darkness and then there was some background radiation called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Then the first stars started to form, then the first galaxies started to form and then um, over about 14 billion years we have the present day universe. So um, it's we, we know that the universe is expanding because of work by Hubble and other astronomers where we can measure the redshift of galaxies and we see that they're all moving away from us, which means that the universe is expanding. And if we turn back time, if everything's expanding now, it must have started at a single point, which we call the Big Bang. Um, and the timeline is about 14 billion years. And galaxies and therefore the solar system have only really formed in the last sort of tiny section of that timeline. Um, and we can actually measure as early as 300, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We are able to measure this cosmic microwave background radiation, which is absolutely incredible, really, when you think about um, being able to look back in time. And just in terms of distances, so we've got the distance now on the top um, axis. We've got us and some pictures in the middle. Oops. And on the bottom is the equivalent light travel time. So if you're sitting in your living room looking at your TV, it actually takes about 10 nanoseconds for light to travel, and that's at a distance of about three meters. It takes um, light from the sun about eight minutes to travel from the sun to us, and that's about 150 million kilometers. Moving out and moving out, it takes the light from Proxima Centauri four years. It takes the light from the Andromeda galaxy 2.5 million years, and it takes the light from the observable universe, 14 billion years, which is 440 sextillion kilometers, which is absolutely crazy. 
um, in terms of kilometers. So if the sun exploded, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes. And, and all the light that we're seeing from the sun is eight minutes in the past. And in this way, we can actually look back in time. So for example, if we are looking at Proxima Centauri, we are seeing light from four years ago. So we, you know, we're looking back in time. And if there were aliens looking at us, they would be seeing the light coming from us, um, depending on where they are. Say, for example, um, maybe they're seeing the light coming from us 200 years ago, and they're looking at a very different Earth to the Earth it is today. So it's very clever. It's a very clever way of looking back in time or time travel in a, in a sense. Um, but it does mean that we are sort of delayed if there was something to happen to the sun, which isn't going to happen. But for example, if the sun did explode, it would take us eight minutes to know about it. And we can evidence the, uh, the Big Bang in various ways, including being able to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation, which was from when the cosmos was just 380,000 years old. And if you had an old um, analog TV, and untune it and the white snow that you used to be able to see on these old TVs I don't know if you've ever seen that but some of that was the cosmic microwave background radiation so that's pretty incredible that we can evidence the Big Bang from um, from this radiation that we can we can measure in space and what that is is the leftover energy from the explosion of the Big Bang so whenever there's an explosion there's going to be a lot of heat and radiation given off and in the same way, from the, after the Big Bang, this CMB radiation was given off and we are still able to measure that today. Now there's other evidence for the Big Bang. So the amount of activity was greater in the past than it is now. So activity is active galaxies, ga galaxies giving off lots of, um, lots of radiation and, and quasars, which are, are similar, and loads of collisions and that kind of activity was greater in the past than it is now, which is showing that the universe has evolved and changed over time. Other evidence um, is pictures like the Hubble Deep Field um, and being able to measure the distances and checking the redshift of galaxies to show that they are um, moving away from us, which shows that the galaxy, um, which shows that the universe is expanding. So that is an observational evidence in favor of the Big Bang. And we can measure that age to be about 14 billion years. And then there's something called Olber's paradox, which says um, if there's that many stars in the galaxy, why isn't the sky really, really bright at night? And obviously this isn't the case. Even if you took away all the light pollution and that sort of thing, the sky would not be really, really bright at night, even though there's that many stars. And that's because the universe is expanding and the redshift is causing the stars to be less bright and their light has weakened so much so that the sky at night is dark. So those are observational evidence for the Big Bang. And there are still some people that don't believe in the Big Bang and that's, you know, that's up to them. But we do have arguments for and against the Big Bang. So for um, the evidence includes the universe is expanding. We can measure the cosmic mi microwave radiation left over from the Big Bang. Um, and we, we are pretty certain that hydrogen and helium were produced in the Big Bang. And these are the most abundant elements in the universe. And then there's things like Olber's paradox as well. But people are still not um, satisfied because there is a chunk of time that we don't know about between the Big Bang and the sort of um, what caused the Big Bang and what happened immediately after it. We don't know about that. And we, um, when we measure the mass in the universe, it doesn't seem to account for the, the, the Big Bang happening. But there is this st stuff called dark matter that might be responsible. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So dark matter is exactly that. So we can measure our mass or the matter um, and we can see the stuff that we're measuring. So we can see galaxies, we can see stars and we can measure how we can measure their, their matter, the stuff. But if you look at a galaxy and you measure its um, speed and its rotation, we have, um, uh, we are able to look at the light that's coming off it and in the, uh, on the orange plot, 
um, you, on the orange line, it's showing what we expect to see. So it's quite a, a flat curve. Um, and what we actually can measure is this green curve. So there's lots and lots of matter in the universe and in the galaxies that we just can't see. And that affects how quickly a galaxy rotates. So that's some evidence for dark matter. Now also, um, when we look at the motion of galaxies and the way they um, cluster together and orbit around each other, we can't see what's going on, but we know that there's gravitational attraction there and that gravity must be coming from the, um, the gravitational forces due to dark matter. Um, light coming from, grav uh, from galaxies gets lensed. So the bottom picture, you can see these long, thin streaks of light. And that's light coming from galaxies that's actually being stretched and, and bent by, um, by, by um, uh, dark matter, we believe, in, in space. And we can also use co um, computer models of the universe. And that gives us this evidence for this dark matter, so for this matter that doesn't give off light. And that has a really important effect in, um, in the way that our universe is going to evolve. In addition to dark matter, we believe that there's this um, force out there called dark energy. And um, dark energy is kind of believed to be a bit like an opposite of gravity. So there, from looking at galaxies and clusters of galaxies, we can see that there are some being pushed apart by a force that's creating space as it pushes apart. So it's the opposite of gravity. Instead of um, pulling things together like gravity does, it's pushing things apart. And that's actually causing the expansion of the universe to speed up and to accelerate. And nobody knows what this force is. And so we have called it dark energy. So there's these dark forces at work, dark matter and dark energy. And they are important because of the fate of the universe and what we think is going to happen to the universe and what, um, how we think um, or why we think the, the Big Bang happens as well. So dark energy um, helps us think about the, what the fate of the universe is going to be. So we are able to measure the fact that the universe is expanding um, and we thought that the expansion rate would slow down, but actually um, uh, it, we thought that the expansion rate would slow down and then gravity would take over and everything will pull back on itself. Um, and eventually the universe will end up doing the opposite of a big bang and doing a big crunch. But actually we see this force that's causing this expansion to accelerate. Um, and so we've, we've coined it dark energy. And we think at the moment, dark energy makes up 73% of the universe and dark matter makes up 23% of the universe. And the rest of the stuff like us, um, makes up just a small proportion of the universe. So that makes us think about the end of the universe. Oops, sorry about that. Um, let me just share my screen again. Um, hang on a minute. I think my, um, my PowerPoint has just crashed, but hopefully you can still see me um, and I'll just get my screen back up. Um, Okay, let's zoom forward. Sorry about this. So we were talking about the fate of the universe. Um, dear me. Right, we were talking about the fate of the universe, the end of the universe. Does anybody know how or what we think is the end of the universe? Does anybody want to tell me what you think is the, um, the fate of the universe? So we talked about dark energy, we've talked about dark matter. Uh, the sun dying, yes, the sun will um, die in about five billion years, but that's, that's the fate, that will be the fate of the solar system. Any ideas about the fate of the universe? So we've had the Big Bang and we've got this expanding universe. What, how is the universe gonna end? So we, we're all gonna freeze, the big crunch, the big freeze. Excellent, excellent stuff, guys. So. The future of the universe is unknown, but we have some ideas based on um, measuring these galaxies and learning more about dark matter and dark energy. So there are a few different ideas. The big crunch is gravity will stop the universe expanding. 
it will start contracting and everything will be destroyed into a big crunch. And then maybe that big crunch then causes a big bang again. And it's a cycle called, called the big bounce. So maybe it's big bang, expand, contract, big crunch, big bang, expand. And maybe we're not the first big bang. Maybe we're part of a cycle of many, many big bangs and many, many universes. Maybe the universe will keep expanding forever. Everything will be too far apart. There will be no sources of light and heat and all things will eventually die. And this is called the big chill or the big freeze. So that's um, the big crunch is where it contracts again. The big chill is where it keeps expanding until everything, um, it, until it's so cold that everything dies. Um, the big rip is um, to do with the big chill, but instead of just expanding, the gravity, um, the expansion gets so strong that it tears everything apart and rips the universe apart, leaving the universe full of single disconnected particles. And then there's another one called the big change, which is all to do with quantum theory. And maybe everything changes so much so that um, the universe becomes destroyed, rewriting the rules of chemistry and maybe recreating atoms that are not anything like the atoms and the pro um, particles that we know today. And this is all to do with dark energy, driving the universe to expand faster and faster and faster um, and, and causing the big, um, the big change. But the, uh, the main thing is that we don't really know. So um, we don't have enough evidence. We are measuring as much as we can. We're learning as much as we can. But the questions to the fate of the universe really do lie with you guys, the next generation of, uh, of cos cosmologists. So if the stuff that I've kind of touched on today has excited you or, or um, made you interested in cosmology, which is all to do with the Big Bang and the, and the Big Crunch and all of that kind of stuff, do find out more and do um, do think about a career in, in, in this industry. Okay, so just to end, I have a five question quiz. So there are five questions on the board. When astronomers look at distant galaxies, what sort of motion do they see? A true or false, some galaxies in our group are moving towards us. Question three, what do astronomers infer from the motion of distant galaxies? Question four, Cosmologists believe this is responsible for the majority of the mass in the galaxy. And then name one of the ways the universe might end. So I'll just give you a minute to um, have a think about those questions. You can type them to me if you want to, or you can just think about them um, for yourselves. And now also, um, we've got a couple of minutes left today. While you're thinking about those, if you do have any other questions, um, feel free to write them in the chat. If I don't have time to answer them today, you're more than welcome to email me via the Eventbrite link or I'll write my email address um, into the chat as well. In two weeks time, this session will be repeated. So it will be the same topic. Um, but in four weeks time, we will do another secondary school session. If you've got any topics that you want us to cover, please feel free to email me and let me know. If you've missed any previous sessions, the recordings will be on the YouTube channel, on the Royal Astronomical Society YouTube channel. And eventually this recording will go up as well. So keep in touch. Um, let's have a look at the answers for this quiz. So question number one, what sort of motion do they see? Um, they see redshift or galaxies moving away from us. Question number two, true or false, there is a galaxy moving towards us. Absolutely true, the Andromeda galaxy. And if all the galaxies are moving away from us, what do astronomers infer? What does that mean? The universe is expanding. Um, and that is, you know, if you, you wind it back in time, it's the, um, it, it, it gives us the idea of the Big Bang. Um, what do cosmologists believe is responsible for the majority of the mass in the galaxy? Dark matter. And then remember dark energy is like a, an opposite to, uh, to gravity keep saying gravity and galaxy mixed up. And number five, one of the ways the universe might end, uh, you could have big chill, big crunch, big freeze, big rip, or big change. There we go. Okay, we've got about two more minutes left. 
So if you do have any questions, I'll stop sharing so that we um, we are back on um, just our faces. Um, if you do have any questions, we've got just a couple of minutes um, that you can uh, uh, you can ask questions by the chat. Um, if I didn't already answer, maybe I missed it, so please do ask it again. Um, and I will also write my email address in here so that you can keep in touch with me if you want to. Keep, it, uh, keep looking at our website for future sessions. Like I said, this session will be repeated in two weeks' time. Okay, so what is a supernova? So if you have a look at my first session on the life cycle of stars, you will see that a supernova is when a um, large star, much bigger than the sun, dies um, and it expands into a red supergiant and then eventually it will explode in a supernova explosion and then it will, um, it will end up as a neutron star or a black hole. Can you have more than one job in, in, a, in the astronomy um, career? Yes, you can. Um, and I think people working in the space industry have to sort of be able to be quite flexible and do lots of things. You're not just an astronomer. You might also be very good at computer programming or presenting or writing or, you know, you have to be quite multi-talented, I think, to, to be in the, in the space industry, which is really exciting, really, because if you're really good at lots and lots of, if you're good at lots and lots and lots of things, but you're not like amazing at one thing, that's perfect. Um, that's perfect. So what else? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, sorry, I'm just having a look at the chat. Um, do you have to be good at maths and science to be in space industry? It helps. It definitely helps. It depends what job you'd like to do. So if you wanted to be a space artist, you don't need to be good at maths. But um, if you're interested in space, you know, there is a job out there for you, but if you're more interested in being like an engineer or a scientist or an astronaut, then generally science and maths are the best um, topics to, to do. Um, and can anyone go into space? Uh, well, you can if you're very, very rich. You can, um, you can be a space tourist and without many qualifications, you can go into space, but it's like millions of pounds at the moment. Um, and what's what would who would I say is the most inspirational astronomer? Well, for me, um, I have a lot of inspiration from women who are on the Cassini um, were Cassini space scientists because I worked with them when I was doing my PhD. But in terms of sort of ancient astronomers, my favourite is Caroline Herschel, William Herschel's sister, who was the first woman to be paid to be an astronomer in the UK and um, discovered eight comets. So she, um, go and look her up, she was pretty cool. A bit of a Cinderella story because she started out as a house servant in her home and ended up being a very, very famous female astronomer, woman astronomer. Okay, we are gonna have to end today's session there. If you do have any other questions, please email me. Um, I'll put my email in the chat again, um, but you can also reply to the Eventbrite link. Um, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. And keep, out, keep an eye out for any other sessions. We've got um, a session with an actor playing the astronaut Gene Cernan on the 4th of June. So if you wanted to ask him any questions, the Eventbrite link again is on our website. So do keep in touch. Hope you enjoyed that session. And um, well, keep safe, keep well, stay away from that coronavirus and um, keep in touch. Take care everyone.